Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Um, I feel like I, I have to introduce myself every time I'm here, and it, I don't know, it feels silly for me, but maybe you don't know me, and that's probably a good thing. But uh, my name is Ryan Fulmer. I'm the student minister here uh, at the St. Albans campus. Um, my family and I have been here, man, like two and a half years now. Um, just uh, glad to be here. Love the opportunity to be up here with the adults every once in a while. Um, generally during second service, I'll be downstairs teaching our uh, students, 6th through 12th grade. Um, and so to have them up here with you guys, with their families, um, is, is a blessing to me. Um, I'm a big proponent of the families need to be the big place where the gospel comes from. So for you guys to commune and, and worship together is, is important to me. So I, I, I appreciate these times for you guys just as much as I like to be up here and, and get to share. So uh, it's a blessing to be here and, and just glad you guys are here this morning. Um, we've, uh, this the last few weeks, started a series called The Acts of God. Uh, and it's a series where we're looking at, at this man named Joseph who was in the Old Testament. Uh, actually, his story carries uh, through Genesis um, chapters 37 through 50. If I, if I understand correctly, it's the longest single narrative of a man in the Bible outside of uh, Jesus himself. Um, but just an incredible story. Um, just of, of the faithfulness of God to this man and how he uses the goods and the bads, the ups and the downs, ultimately to bring about God's glory and God's will through him. Um, but just to kind of catch us up on where we've been in the last few weeks, I want to kind of remind you, and in case you're not familiar with the story, what's gone on so far where we find ourselves today is in a, in a difficult spot for Joseph. So I want us to catch up to kind of where, we, where we're supposed to be. And we started off with this, the series with this man, Joseph, who is a favorite of his father. Uh, he had several brothers, and he was the favorite. Dad bought, built him or made him a coat, a coat of many colors, and uh, Dad made it known. He was the favorite. And Joseph uh, began to have dreams where his family would uh, basically be worshiping him, be bowing down to him. And so that, that just added to the resentment of his brothers. That even upset his father. His brothers got so tired of him, so sick of, of daddy's little boy that one day when they were out in the field, they decided they were going to kill him. But instead of killing him, they just, they, uh, one of the other brothers spoke up and said, let's just sell him. We can tell daddy's dead, but we don't have to be responsible for him dying. And I believe the brother was actually planning on coming back to save him. But what happened is um, the, the, uh, they sold him into slavery. They, they found a band of, of uh, slave traders coming along and they sold their brother into slavery and said, you know, we'll never see you again. You might as well be dead. Brought the coat to dad with blood on it, said, said your favorite son's gone. I'm sorry. Uh, Joseph, meanwhile, is taken to Egypt. He's bought as a slave by a man named Potiphar, who is the captain of the guard of Pharaoh. He's very high, high official in, in, the, uh, in the country of Egypt. In Potiphar's house, Joseph prospers as a, as a slave. He, he's trusted with everything. Um, uh, under Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife begins to see him and pursue him, finding him attractive. And uh, Joseph resists in a country thousands of miles away, probably hundreds of miles away from his home, um, resists where no one would have ever known the difference. And she screams that he has attacked her when he flees. And so falsely accused, Joseph finds himself in jail. So the story we're going to look at today is, is uh, just about a, a little over a chapter long. And uh, that makes me a little nervous. Um, just this past week, uh, we started a series downstairs called Acts. Uh, with the book of Acts. I'm pretty creative in my series titles, but we're in the book of Acts. And um, I, told, I was telling the students as we were getting started, you know, I'm going to aim today to get through Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And one of my more polite, less talkative, she just gasped, uh, students said, great, we're going to be here till midnight. Um, so... Um, with God's providence, with God's love, we'll get through this chapter today uh, before Dave gets back to preach next week. So let's pray for, our, for this time together in God's word, and we're going we're gonna to get into this thing. Let's pray together. Um, Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the example of men in the Bible that we can follow after, but more, more than anything, thank you for your acts, for the way that you are involved in our lives. And I just ask as we get into your word this morning, that it will be all about you. We'll make a big deal about you and that you'll change us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so just a few months ago, my, my wife and I had the chance to come up and share. And, and not all of you will know our story, but my wife and I have gone through, really honestly, the hardest year of our lives. And without going into too much detail, 
just for those that don't know, we had a very difficult pregnancy. I uh, found that we were having twins, a very complicated issue within the womb for the twins. Ended up losing one. Very, very, very much the grace of God that we got the other one. Um, and just been through a rough year. And even in the time since we shared last, it's not, it hasn't let up. Uh, I was t- just sharing after first service. Really after we shared a, a month or so ago, I really feel like the spiritual attack really happened in our house. And there's been some really difficult things that have gone on. Our, our, our family is healthy. Our marriage is healthy. But spiritually, we've just been beat up. And we, we shared that week. I shared that same week that I, I'm, I'm not convinced of the old quip that the only things that are guaranteed are death and taxes. I just disagree. I just can't buy it. One, because Jesus is promising to come back and his church will not taste death when he comes back. But also, we re- you read in the paper all the time, people skipping out on taxes, so that's just a bunch of lo- hooey to me. I'm convinced the one thing that we all in this room will share and we do share in together is pain. Convinced of it. If you're not hurting right now, for some reason you will be. Just keep living. And this world is going to have trouble. This world is going to have pain. And by the grace of Jesus, we'll come through it. But I think that's why today's message, I think it's... I think it's God's work that I'm in this one today, not because I'm great, but because of what he's just brought us through and is bringing us through still. But this message has something for all of us because this is something that we'll all be able to relate to. Christian, non-Christian, it doesn't matter. You understand pain. So that's where we're at today. We're looking at a time in, in, in uh, Joseph's life that was very easily probably the most discouraging time of his life. We're going to talk about trusting God in a time of discouragement. See, discouragement is something that we all face because life is hard. Discouragement is something that we all encounter because life gets very difficult. And I'm convinced the devil uses discouragement as one of his greatest tools against us, especially against Christ church. I'm convinced because when you're discouraged, oftentimes your focus is not on God. Your focus is on yourself. When you're discouraged, you become well up on your feelings and your hurts, and you're not trusting in a God who rules and reigns over everything. Discouragement really is a tool of the devil used to keep us from worshiping and trusting the one true God. And here's what we got to do. Here's what we're going to push on today. There's going to be times in your life, and it may be a time you're in right now, you're going to have to go with what you know and not with what you feel. I love you guys. There's a lot of students sitting in this section this morning. You're really bad about doing what you feel and not what you know. But tell them, let me tell you, I can relate. It's part of growing up, right? Isn't a sign of maturity where you don't feel like getting up for your job in the morning, but you know you have to have a paycheck to eat, right? And when you, ha- when you, get, when you grow, you begin to go with what you know and not with what you feel. And that is also true in the Christian walk. See, I know that running would be beneficial for my health. But I don't feel like running. I also know that getting up every morning and, and seeking Christ through his word and prayer and and offering you guys up before him, and offering my family up before him, I don't always feel like seeking Jesus. But I know that I need to for the sake of myself and my family and this church that I love. And this is especially true in our times of discouragement. We have to go with what we know. You have to go. There has to be some rock-solid, yes, I believe this no matter what in your life, the first being that Jesus Christ is God. And you have to stand on that no matter how tall the water gets, right? It doesn't matter how tall the water is. It matters how, uh, what rock you're standing on. It matters what you're, you're standing on. And so what we're going to talk about today is, is looking at what we know and not what we feel. We need to know what goes on. We need to know things and not feel things to get through these times of discouragement. Because these hard times are going to come if they're not. And here's the truth, and here's the, of Joseph's life and maybe of yours. These hard times don't have to be your fault. Sometimes they are. But Joseph has done everything right as far as we can read. But he was hated and betrayed by his brothers. They sold him into slavery. He was bought as a slave, falsely accused by, accused by Potiphar's wife. And he's in prison. So what do we do when we're in a place that should be discouraging? In a place where we should feel down, what do we do in those times? We stick with what we know. So I'm hoping today we'll find encouragement through a time that should have been discouraging for Joseph. And there's two things I want to point out before we get into. Two things, before we talk about what we know, there's two things that we need to know that he doesn't know. See, Joseph had these dreams as a kid of his family worshiping him. The text doesn't 
give this as a promise like going to happen. This is just a dream he had. Okay, so we don't know fully if he grasps what that means. But also, here's what we know Joseph doesn't know. Joseph doesn't know the future. Joseph isn't sitting in prison in this time of the story and going, that's okay, I know it's going to happen. No, you need to put yourself in his shoes and say, he's in a place where he should probably feel pretty down. But we're going to see him stick with what he knows, even though he does not know the future. So what we're going to look today is, is just four things that we need to know when these times come. And what we're going to do is just pick up in Genesis chapter 39, uh, where, where our story picks up today. It says, Joseph's master, this is after he's falsely accused, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was in there, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph, and he gave him success, whatever he did. Repeatedly in this narrative, repeatedly if you read the, just the whole story in chapters 37 through 50, there's a common thing that is said over and over and over about Joseph's life. It says that the Lord was with him. It says that twice in these two short verses we just read. Which just brings us the most important thing we have to know. You have to know that God is always with you. You have to know that. When life gets discouraging, you have to know God is always with you. The psalmist in 139 puts it like this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I free, flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is death, the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall overcome me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Our greatest defense, Christians, our greatest defense, brothers and sisters, is that you know God is with you. That has to be, and you know what's ironic about this, is that's the first thing we tend to forget, isn't it? I'm going to speak a lot about of experience here this morning. We tend to forget that God is really, he's always with us. See, don't, don't you like to be surrounded by the people you love in the hardest times? Don't you know when you're hurting, you want your, your family with you, you want your close friends with you, you want those that are with you because you know they care. How much more should we take comfort in the fact that God himself is near the brokenhearted. God himself will be with you always. And what that does, what that creates in us as followers of Jesus, what that creates in us is a thing called integrity. When we understand that God is everywhere you go. He doesn't change. He doesn't shift. He doesn't move. He's the same everywhere you go. What that will create in you is integrity. So we live in a day and a time where you can't go anywhere without there being a video camera. Whether it's walking through Walmart, there's always three or four cameras on you. Whether, I mean, if you come into our church, especially in the daycare, there are cameras for safety of the kids, for, for safety of the facility. You, and then if you're out on the street, you know, how often do you watch the news and there's something going on, on the street and what's the tape, what's the video come from? It comes from a phone. You can go nowhere and do nothing, it seems, without a video camera being able to record your actions. And you would think this would build integrity in us. Like I said, you watch the news every night, and there are people every night on video doing dumb things. Because I'll tell you, integrity will not come from having a, a video camera in your face. Integrity will come from knowing that God himself is with you always. And you will begin to be the same. Even in the most discouraging time, you can trust that God is with you, that he has not forgotten you, that he has not left you, especially in those hard times. And we must trust you must know this to get through these discouraging times. And see, this integrity that, that Joseph carried, this integrity, even in a time where he had every right to be mad at God and, and, and walk away, this integrity led him to a place where he could speak in other people's lives. It led him to a place where he was given responsibility as a prisoner in prison. See, the very next natural thing to know is if you know God is always with you, you know God is working in every situation. You have to know that. No matter what's going on in your life right now, you have to know that there is a God alive and active and working in everything. Whatever you're in right now, he's working, he's moving, he's active, 
He is not static. He's always moving. Just we'll read on in the story. It says, Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in the custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw they were dejected, so he asked Pharaoh's officials, who were in custody with him in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? Several things just, just in my mind, just scream of God's movement in this story. And again, we can see it from a different perspective than Joseph. But several things. And the men who got in trouble just happened to work for Pharaoh. You'll see, if you know the story, you know later why that's important. If you don't know, I won't tell you. You can go home and read why this is important that these men happened to just work for Pharaoh. They just happened to work for Pharaoh. And they just happened to get in trouble at the same time. We don't know if it was the same scenario or what, but they just happened to get in trouble and thrown in prison at the same time. And they just happened to be put in the same prison that Joseph was put in. And they just happened to be put under Joseph's assignment. And they just happened to have dreams on the exact same night. And they just happened to have dreams that have meaning to them. Do we see the work of God here? Can we look at the story and go, wow, he's, uh, he's there whether we mention him or not, right? See, God truly is in the details of the story. He's truly in the details of your life. There's nothing that goes on in your life. And you know what? That's really hard for me to believe when there's a car in front of me going 40 in the 50, right? When he's supposed to, they're supposed to go in 55 because the speed limit's 50, but that's just suggested. So, you know, don't go 40, go 55, right? That's hard for me to trust that God's in the details of those times. It's, it's hard for me to trust that God's in the details when we're running late and, you know, my, my three-year-old who hasn't wet herself in a year wets herself. It's like, really? Now you're going to wet yourself because you've done this for like a year now. But trusting that God's in the details, God's working in everything, trusting that God is working in every situation. But God knows his plans, and sometimes that's enough. He doesn't have to let us know. We have to trust we have to have what they call faith, that God is working in every situation. See, I think that Joseph could have felt discouraged. Joseph could have fell off, but he still maintain, maintained his integrity. I think so because he had faith that God was working even while he was in prison, even allowing him into prison. See, Joseph even uses this time to minister to people. How often when we are in a time of discouragement, we become self-focused. We become very self-consumed. Uh, oh, my pain. Oh, my hurt. And I'm, again, speaking from experience. We begin to think this is about us, and that's never the point. God doesn't even give you bad circumstances nor good circumstances to make you think about you. He's always calling you to himself. And Joseph takes the very, I think, natural step when he's living a life of integrity, he's living a life of faith, that even in this time, he does what we should do, and he knows what we should know. He knows that God is to be made known, even in your times of discouragement. Know that God is to be made known. And in verse 8, it says, We both had dreams, uh, but there is no, no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Even in this time where Joseph is falsely imprisoned, even this time where he could have been down and self-focused and worried about himself, even in this time, the people he's taking care of, he's still concerned about their needs. I think this is an automatic thing for him. I think Joseph was so convinced of God's movement in his life that even in the worst times, he could still love. And I wonder why we don't. I wonder why I struggle in this way. I think sometimes we struggle in this way because we're afraid... Maybe it'll be embarrassing to let people know that we're discouraged, and, but we can still help. Maybe, maybe we don't feel adequate, or maybe we feel like that God's going to look bad. If we let God know how bad our life is and we still try to help people, maybe God's going to look bad. Okay, so you can help in bad times, but God's not helping in bad times? Are you greater than God? I think that there are many reasons we can find, but I'm really convinced of this, that our hardest times should be the times we proclaim God the most. Our hardest times should be the times where we speak the loudest because our hardest times really reveal to us who we are. And we are in need of God. Paul, 
in the New Testament speaks of a thorn that God has given him. God has allowed to have in his life something that is causing him problems. We don't know if it's a physical thing for sure or a spiritual thing. There's a lot of assumptions, but we don't know for sure. I tend to, I tend to agree with Dave. I think it was a, a physical issue with his eyes. But here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians about this. There are times I pleaded, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, about this thorn, that it should leave me But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And this is Paul. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Proclaiming God in our brokenness, I think, brings him the most glory because that's when we're truly dependent upon him the most. So Joseph asked these guys, what's going on? Why so downcast? And they began to share their dreams. He says, so the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me. On the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed and its clusters ripened into grapes. Uh, Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. I don't think this is a very creative dream. What do you think? This is, this is what the dream means, Joseph says. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will, will, lift you up, will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to do when you were, uh, when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of prison. For I was forcibly carried off to the land of the Hebrews. And even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Just want to put on a side note here. In these hard times, in these times of not being inwardly focused, I'm not saying we don't try to, we don't want out of them. I'm not saying you sit and mope in your bad times. We are still active and begging. And I tell you how much I've begged God to pull us through some things the last several months. But even though we are proclaiming him in these times, we still are asking to get out just as Joseph did. The story continues. Then the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a, fa- a favorable interpretation and said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. Uh, in the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is, what, this is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat away your flesh. I think sometimes in proclaiming God, proclaiming truth to people even in our hard times, we have to proclaim the hard things. You have to speak the truth even when it's the hard things. And if, if you don't hear me incorrectly, understand me when I say that's the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel, if you're sharing your faith, you're going to have to tell people that they need a Savior. Therefore, they're going to have to need to be saved. But saved from what? The gospel, the good news, means nothing until we first understand the bad news. We understand the bad news of we are sinful people who have denied God. He sits on throne on a throne in the universe, ruling and reigning, and we deny him by doing what we want and not what he commands. We have to to let let the world know that they are in a desperate situation on their own. You, here today, if you do not know Jesus, you are in a desperate situation all by yourself. Your time of discouragement should lead you to despair and sorrow. Because you have no one to carry you through it. You have nothing to stand on without Jesus. Your sin sits on your shoulder. And there is a holy and good and just God. If he loves good things, if God loves good things, he must hate bad things. It's required. Because he is holy, he must punish people that deny him. He must punish people that do not sit under his authority. Any good king would. Any earthly king, if you try to pull them off the throne, would have you killed. And God is way more holy and good than them. But it doesn't end there. 
We've got to share that bad news, but it doesn't end there. It ends with the fact that God didn't just stop there and say they're, they're sinful and holy. Give them what they deserve. God said, I have a plan for this. I had this plan before the world was given. I'm going to send my son Jesus, and he's going to bear the weight of the sin. He's going to bear the wrath and the punishment of those who would believe in him. He's going to go and be put on a cross. See, what you have to understand is Jesus wasn't concerned about nails in a tree. Jesus wasn't concerned about being whipped and having a crown of thorns. Jesus was concerned about the wrath of God poured out on him on the cross, but he did it for a reason and for a purpose, to save a people, to save, a, to save his church. And if we don't know that, we don't proclaim that, even in the good times, let alone the bad times, we don't understand the significance of who Jesus is. And we must proclaim these things, good or bad. But here's what I want to tell you. I think people will listen more to you when you proclaim that when life is hard. How easy is it to proclaim Jesus when life is easy? How easy is it to, to tell people how great God is when your life is all in order? It's not as easy to proclaim it when life is falling apart. But that's part of who we are as a people. And that's part, I really believe, proclaiming God in your time of discouragement will encourage you as much as it encourages anybody. Can I tell you from experience again, the, t the days I sat and moped around on myself were the worst days. The days I made a choice to be intentional about sharing Jesus were the best days. It didn't bring back the son that we lost. It didn't fix the, the troubles in my house. But... It brought me to where I needed to be at the feet of Jesus. So Joseph's interpretations come true. He tells the, the cupbearer, in three days you'll be back. Three days he's back. He tells the baker, in three days, uh, at least three days you will die. And within three days he was dead. But it just turned even worse for Joseph. It tells us at the end of chapter 39 that the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. Joseph said, when you're back in Pharaoh's court, when you're back working for him, remember me. Remember what I did for you. Remember how I helped you. Remember how I was here for you. And the cupbearer, after re being received back by Pharaoh, forgot Joseph. If there was ever a time that Joseph had the right to feel discouraged and maybe even give up, now was the time. See, he had continued to do everything right. He did what he was supposed to do. He was even being used by God in prison. Think about that. He was in prison. God was using him as a tool for his good, interpreting these dreams, and still he was forgotten and nothing changed. And if anything, Joseph probably felt worse at this time. And it tells us how long he had to sit in it. Chapter 41, the verse verse says this, when two full years had passed. Like I said, we're not going to pull Joseph out of prison today. We're going to leave him. Because maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're begging to get out of prison and you're just there. Maybe you're just begging to get out of this time of, of hurt and discouragement and you're just there. Sometimes that's where you're going to be. But we're going to leave him in prison. And again, Joseph doesn't know the future. All we know is that for two full years, he sat in this. For two full years, he waited. Not even knowing it was two years. But he knew. But here's what you must understand. The last thing you must no, when faced in times of encouragement, you must know that God's timing is perfect. There's not a day that he has forgotten you. There's not been a moment you threw him off guard. There's not been a thing that you've done that he wasn't ready for. His timing is perfect. You haven't prayed a prayer he wasn't ready for. You haven't given a sacrifice he didn't know you were going to do. You didn't love someone he didn't know you were going to love. He's heard your cries. He hears your hurts. But his timing is perfect. You must know that. His timing is perfect. See, Joseph won't see the future, but we'll see it for him in a, in a few weeks. You gotta know that you're not alone. If you feel like you're just stuck, if you feel like you're there and no one else understands, you gotta know you're not alone. Because one lie the devil does, one thing the devil does is discourage you. The lie the devil gives you is that you're the only one. And I'm here to tell you, you are not the only one who feels like God's messed up the timing on this one. But there's a lot of biblical examples of this too. Uh, we see with Abraham and Sarah, God promised Abraham, you'll have a son and you'll be the father of many nations. And he waited 25 years to see that son. Moses was in the wilderness tending sheep for 40 years before God called him to lead his people. David was anointed next king over Israel while Saul was alive and waited more than 10 years before Saul died and David got the throne. Saul of Tarsus, also known as Paul, 
stopped by Jesus on the road to Damascus and said, you will be preaching to the Gentiles, waited over 10 years or 10 years before he preached his first missionary journey. And here Joseph waits two full years. I'm impatient with the microwave. I don't know if you are. I think that the microwave should work faster, let alone the stove or the oven. I want things now. I'm not a very patient person. I think the Lord is teaching me to trust in his timing because I think he knows better. And maybe he's showing you the same. And maybe, maybe what God is doing by leaving you here is he's binding you to himself. I think God may just be wanting you to seek him so that you'll seek him. Maybe he's wanting you to cry out so that you'll cry out. Maybe he's having you do this so that you will stick to him because you'll find out he's never left. Here's what I'm convinced. If we will not stick to God when, when we're in pain, we will not stick to God when we're in prosperity. If you will not stick with him when life is bad, you will not seek him when life is good. So perhaps he allows the season so that you will be bound to him for eternity. So we have to remember the most important thing. So we have a God who can relate. We have a God who understands. We have a God who's been here and done that. We have a God who has felt forsaken by his Father. When Jesus cries out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We have one who knows, who's been there. Knows what it's like to feel distant from God, but he endured. We must, every day, Christians, we must come back to Christ every day and remember that Jesus has been there already and he's endured more than we will ever endure. And he will never leave us or forsake us. He is more faithful than we are. He will use everything for our good. He is more wise than we could ever be. And he alone will sustain us because he is strong. My brothers and sisters, I want to lovingly tell you, you are not strong. I am not strong. We are weak. He is strong. Paul emphasizes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want to look at this for just a minute. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. And here's where, where he's going at with this. In, in the first century, if you were going to keep something valuable, you would hide it in something plain. Uh, you know, an example would be a jar of clay. Just a regular pot. You might hide your jewelry in it. Because if someone were to come in looking for stuff, they're probably going to miss the clay pot. And what he's doing is he's comparing us to a clay pot. And he's doing it out of love. But he says, we have this treasure. This treasure is the gospel. This treasure is Jesus. We have this treasure in jars of clay. We are jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I just want to pay attention to this. If you want to throw that next slide up there. Where just, this is a comparison. He's jumping back and forth from the clay pot, the jar, to God's surpassing power. He's saying, we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed because of God's surpassing power. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair because of the surpassing power that belongs to God. We are persecuted, but not forsaken because the surpassing power belongs to God. We are struck down and not destroyed because the surpassing power belongs to God. I think Paul's wanting us to understand something here. And he continues in verse 16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Can you relate to that? Though your outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light and momentary. Think about eternity here. Light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Maybe you're in it right now because he has something so great for you that he'll take eternity to show it to you. As we look not on the things that are seen, not the circumstances, but to the, but to the things that are unseen, the God who is over all of it. For the things that are seen are transient. They'll go away. It'll go. It may not go, it may not be until you die. <laughs> you know, there are things you will have until you die. But the things that are unseen are eternal. And that has to be our focus. We have to know that God's timing is perfect. He's allowing us to be where we're at because he's got a purpose for every moment he keeps you in it. If he had something better, he'd do that. 
but because he loves you, he leaves you where you are. And we must use these times to run to God, not run from him. We must use these times to understand his surpassing power will keep us, especially in our times of discouragement. We must know he is always with us. We must know he is working in every situation. We must know he is to be made known even in our times of discouragement. And we must know his timing is perfect. And my friends, those will carry you. Those will keep you because you're standing on the rock that does not move. So this story, just to close today, reminds me of another story. There's another man namely Jesus, who was falsely accused, who was being falsely punished for something he had not done, who found himself on a tree hanging between two men, just as Joseph found him in prison, himself in prison with two men. I always find it ironic, or just maybe one of those little God things where we have the cupbearer, the guy that has the wine, and, and the baker, the guy that has the bread. We have the, we have the the wine and the bread even here. But we have these two men in with an innocent man. One is given life and freedom. One is given death. At the cross, we have two men hanging on either side of Jesus. One says he, he saved others. He can't even save himself. And the other one says, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. The only thing that changed his situation was his faith. Putting his faith in Jesus changed his eternity, even on the cross. It didn't get him out of the cross. It didn't save him from the nails. It didn't save him from dying. But it saved him for eternity. Putting his faith in Jesus changed everything, though his circumstance didn't. And I'm going to call you and beg you and plead with you, as Paul commands us to plead with you, to put your faith in Jesus if it's not there, if you have not given your life to Jesus, you sit separate from him. If you put your faith, it may not change your circumstances. Here's what I want to tell you. Christianity does not mean an easy life. I know this because Jesus lived a perfect life and they killed him. His apostles were obedient unto death, most of them martyred because they were obedient. Don't come to Jesus because you think life will be easy. Come to Jesus because he's the Lord of the universe and he can forgive you of your sin. If you repent of your sin, if you'll put your faith in him, he will give you life forever. He will be your rock in the worst times of discouragement. He'll be your rock in the greatest times of your life and he'll be even better. And he'll spend eternity pouring out his love on you. So I'm going to do two things this morning as we close. I want to ask of you, if you haven't made Jesus your Lord, I want to ask you to put your faith in Jesus today. He'll forgive you of your sin. He'll cleanse you. He'll give you his righteousness and call you son or daughter. I want to call you to Jesus today. And if you know Jesus already and your life is falling apart or you just feel like you're in a situation where no one would understand, I may not fully understand, but I'll understand somewhat. I want, you to, I want, I want to invite you to come up and pray with me. I would love to pray with you. Whatever circumstance you're in, we have a God who can relate. Jesus has been through all of it just worse than we have. So as we close today, I want to make it about Jesus. If he's not your Lord, make him your Lord today. If he is your Lord and you need prayer, please come up and let me pray with you. We understand that these times of discouragement are real for everybody. And we need a God who is unchanging and involved in all of it. Let's pray. Jesus, we have nothing if we don't have you. For those that don't, Lord, please make them yours this morning. For those that do, Lord, may they just plant their feet that much more solid on your rock, knowing that you will sustain them no matter what. May our lives be all about you. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for carrying me. I know you're faithful because I've seen it. And what I wouldn't give for someone else to have that too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.